going to start this morning with Dr. Pierre Latour. He received his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from Virginia Tech, his Master's and his PhD in Chemical Engineering from Purdue University. Uh, he's the Vice Chairman of Principia International and has spent a long career in the field of uh, process control engineering, working uh, with, in particularly with the uh, petrochemical industries. Uh, and he is an avowed greenhouse, greenhouse gas theory skeptic. So, <laughs> Dr. Latour is going to kick us off with our morning's uh, considerations of our global climate. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Pierre Latour. Thank you very much. Good morning. I really learned a lot from this uh, Electric Universe conference this week. I want to say a special thank you to Dave Talbert for inviting me to address you this morning. Um, I have some notes before my prepared talk, can't help it. Um, here's a comment. I choose to say that God is love, among many other things, just like Pierre Marie's mother. Love is a force for gratitude, appreciation, and justice. I have lots of evidence that, that those exist. So I think I'm on solid ground to say atheists are probably wrong. Okay. Um, since I retired from the, the business of computer control of oil refineries and chemical plants, um, I decided to work on, on a temperature controller for the earth. And after seven or eight years, um, I really have in trouble, I can't find the, get a grip on this greenhouse gas theory in the language of nature, which is mathematics. There are numerous versions of the theory, and the uh, best I could tell, they're all empirical, they're correlations of historic data, and there's not much consensus about which one is right. So my position is I claim there's overwhelming scientific and engineering consensus that the greenhouse gas theory does not exist. Um, the effect of CO2 on temperature of the earth is vanishingly small. The science is settled, and I've got sufficient evidence to prove those claims beyond any reasonable doubt. Um, I also think greenhouse gas theory is not only falsifiable, but I falsified it. It's false. The, the main argument of the greenhouse gas and global warming climate change promoters is that the scientific consensus says that the greenhouse gas theory is valid. They also say the science is settled, and they also say it's un unfalsifiable. Those are three claims. Our culture is full of people making claim and claim after claim after claim after claim. And one of the things that attracted me to this conference is it's all about evidence. Well, those claims that they make, they have no supporting evidence. And in fact, they seem to be unaware that their last claim moves the greenhouse gas theory from the realm of science into religion and, and uh, superstition. The main, I want to give you this too, the main idea of the greenhouse gas theory, as I understand it, is that back radiation, it's, it's called back radiation, and what they mean, I think, is radiant heat transfers from cold CO2 molecules way up high in the atmosphere comes down and is absorbed by the already warmer surface, warming it more. In my humble opinion, this violates the second law of thermodynamics um, that says heat transfers from hot to cold, not from cold to hot. And, uh, and I actually um, proved, you see, if it, hit, if it comes down cold and heats the earth warmer, then that's going to radiate more and it's going to uh, heat the CO2 more, and it's going to—it's a two-way street. 
of energy transfer by radiant heat transfer, and I'm troubled with that. Um, I did a math on that, and uh, I think it constitutes, it, it also violates the first law because it's, it's creation of energy. And that's called the perpetual motion machine of the second kind. And that's just what a global warming believer needs in order to scare anybody and tax him. And my last little comment here is I share Pierre Marie Robitaille's skepticism of the Kirchhoff law. And I abandoned that myself, all by myself, some time ago. Okay. So the title of my talk is Engineering. That's kind of a good word for me. Uh, I'm old school. Uh, today it's called technology. And it's, they don't like that engineering, but I'm, I'm still an, I'm, I'm an engineer and proud of it. Engineering Earth's thermostat with CO2, that's carbon dioxide. Question mark. Well, the summary of what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you right now. Earth's temperature in the atmosphere, atmospheric temperature, is a chemical process system. And a review of control system engineering of Earth's thermostat with anthropogenic CO2 back in 1997, I proved that it will never work because it's unmeasurable, unobservable, and uncontrollable system. CO2 does not affect temperature in a meaningful way. In fact, temperature affects CO2 in the atmosphere. There, is no, there are no greenhouse gases in physics, and CO2 is not a pollutant. It's green plant food. Global warming stabilized since 1998. So if you need to go, you got it. The purpose of my talk is I'm going to employ some physics, and some chemistry, throw in a little mathematics at the end, do some engineering work, economics, history, and ethics. And I'm going to deploy those fields to identify the barriers to designing a thermostat to control Earth's atmospheric temperature by adjusting its CO2 input. The method I'm going to use is this. People have beliefs and knowledge. Knowledge of nature is discovered by the scientific method. The theory is in the language of nature, which is mathematics, prediction and verification. Such discoveries are held to be true until falsified by said scientific method. I'm going to offer some claims supported by credible evidence, settled science that warrant how one can know that they are true. Some sound engineering requires no less. No opinion here, no speculation, no controversy, no politics, no alarmist adjectives are allowed. When an unlicensed engineer resorts to name calling and threats, I declare victory and move on. <laughs> thermostat. What is it? A thermostat is a temperature controller. Like most control systems, it consists of a measurement from a thermometer or a thermocouple, a comparison with a desirable set point, setting, thereby creating an error or deviation, and feeding that error signal back into a control algorithm that determ determines an appropriate adjustment to some manipulated variable, like combustion fuel flow, that corrects the error temperature, and thereby holding it in the neighborhood of zero. So control systems engineering is part of most other engineering disciplines, like chemical, mechanical, electrical, aeronautical, biological, and civil. Just a word on my credentials. I built a thermostat to verify my PhD thesis. The title was Time Optimum Control of Chemical Processes. And I did that back in 1966. I developed my theory, and I built my thermostat, and I showed my professor that it worked the way I said it was going to work, and he let me out of there. I made the first computer control loop of a temperature in Shell Oil Company's oil refinery. It was a cat cracker regenerator thermostat, and it's located in Deer Park, Texas. I did that in 1967. I worked on digital autopilots and spacecraft trajectory controls for NASA's Apollo program in 1968 and 1969. I actually invented and commercialized hundreds of what we call true boiling point thermostats for petroleum product quality in the hydrocarbon processing industry worldwide since 1970. Uh, crude oil, petroleum, has got a, an enormous mixture of different boiling range hydrocarbons in it. And the first process in a refinery is distillation. And there's side draws from that column 
that come out by, as a virtue of their boiling points. And the key properties of gasoline and naphtha and kerosene, jet fuel and diesel and fuel oil are boiling ranges and they're controlled by thermostats. I'm a registered professional chemical engineer in Texas and I'm a registered control system engineer professionally in, in California. And I was co named Control Engineer of the Year in 1999 by Control Magazine and Purdue's Outstanding Chemical Engineer in 2007. Um, I'm a contributor to the U.S. Senate Minority Report of 700 scientists that dissent and debunk the, about man-made global warming that was published in 2009 by the Environmental Committee of the United States Senate that's chaired by Barbara Boxer, who hasn't read this report of hers. I personally finance this paper. I have no financial incentive on the outcome. I seek no government or business funding, and I am a global warming skeptic not denier. It's not my job to get the, get the physics right, but um, I think I can help mankind if I can f put some holes in what they think is right and, uh, and get closer to the truth. So here's some stuff on science. Science one. CO2 is not a pollutant. It's a harmless green plant food. CO2 is the inert result of complete oxidation of hydrocarbons. There are only two CO2 gas phase reactions that I'm aware of, and both are endothermic, arc welding and photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is simplified is basically CO2 plus water plus sunlight equals sugars and starches and oxygen catalyzed by chlorophyll, as you heard in the and the beautiful talk we had, I guess, yesterday on, on how sap can run up and down a tree simultaneously. Uh, just a note, the United States Navy submarines limit the amount of CO2 down there to something less than 8,000 parts per million. But the reason is not because it's going to hurt anybody. It just displaces oxygen, which we need. Science two, halting all combustion of hydrocarbons that's oil, gas, coal, and wood, by man will not measurably affect the atmospheric CO2 content, which is now about 380 parts per million. It's actually approaching about 400 parts per million by volume. Simple material balance shows that man generates about three, 30 billion tons per year CO2. Now, this is neither a big number nor a small number. It's just a number. While plants, my understanding is they consume on the order of 7 trillion tons per year of CO2. And this is neither a big number nor a small number, it's just a number, huh? Forest fires, rotting flora, volcanoes input most of the CO2 to the atmosphere. So the total input or output is somewhat more than 7 trillion tons per year. I'm going to do some fancy math for you here. If I do the ratio of 0.03 divided by 7, the fraction is 0 0.0043. Now, I think that's kind of a small ratio, but I'm prejudiced. <laughs> Cutting that 30 in half to 15 will drop the CO2 in the atmosphere by about 100 parts per million after about 70 years. Whether you like it or not. Science three. CO2 does not affect temperature. Rather, temperature affects CO2. Data for the last 400,000 years by Al Gore in Inconvenient Truth, which was published in 2005, shows that they cycle together. But on close examination, the CO2 actually lags the temperature by about 800 years. And I've seen this. I know the work that's done. I did some of it myself, and I've seen it. It's substantiated by actually a lot of environmentalists. The Environmental Engineering Department of the University of, of St. Thomas in Houston, for one. Solubility of CO2 in water, solubility, that's chemical engineering stuff, of CO2 in water and the oceans and beer and champagne decreases with temperature. Write that down, remember that. So, solar warming of the ocean will release dissolved CO2 and cooling of the ocean will reabsorb it. Solar radiation drives Earth's temperature. CO2 has essentially nothing to do with it. 
We control engineers worry a lot about a, a concept called a distinction between correlation and causation. Correlation can be absolutely perfect. Two measured variables in the world can be correlated. Do not necessarily conclude that there's a cause and effect relationship unless you got some on the line physics to back it up. The rooster might crow 20 minutes before the sun rises every single day, but he's got nothing to do with it. Okay, science four. Atmospheric radiation absorption and emission is dominated by the presence of all three phases of H2O in the atmosphere. Three phases, gas, liquid, and solid. Like all molecules, CO2 only absorbs and emits in specific spectral wavelengths. A typical one I gather is 14.7 microns. I'm not a spectroscopist, so you there's a lot of smart guys around here that know more about this than I do. But that constitutes a tiny fraction of the solar radiation energy in Earth's atmosphere. I understand the first 50 parts per million CO2 absorbs about half of this tiny energy at that wavelength, and each additional 50 parts per million absorbs half of the remaining tiny fraction. So the current 380 parts per million, there's almost no absorbable photons left over. CO2 could triple to 1,000 with no additional discernible absorption or emission. This is called the Beer-Lambert Law. The intensity of radiation decreases exponentially as it passes through an absorbing medium. Science five. There's no such thing as a greenhouse gas because the atmosphere has no glass house on top of it. I'll refer you to German physicists Gerhard Gerlich and Rolf Teschner, who proved this in their classic paper they titled Falsification of the Atmospheric CO2 Greenhouse Effects Within the Frame of Physics and they published it in the International Journal. And I've, you can download the PDF from that, that URL. Science six, Earth's temperature increased naturally uh, about 0.6 C from 1976 to 1998 and has stabilized since then, actually decreasing about a tenth Celsius from 205 to 209. Forecasts of long-term cooling are credible in my opinion but they're really irrelevant to the claim that anthropogenic CO2 does not affect temperature. CO2 content did not accelerate very much at the onset of the increase in hydrocarbon combustion by man since 1900. Science seven. This may be archaic, but I just have to say this, and, and uh, I hope I can communicate this idea properly. What troubles me is the claim that Ice melts because the temperature is warming, meaning any time the temperature increases, they say, hmm, ice is going to melt. That's universal in the language and the, news, and the media for 20 years. And I don't like that. It's not right. It's not said right. Warming or cooling, I, those words mean the rate of change of surface temperature at some moment in time. That does not affect whether or not melting or freezing rate of water. The only thing that matters is the average temperatures of its surroundings. So long as that ice cube in your glass, the, around that ice, the, the, the surroundings are greater than zero Celsius, it's gonna melt. The rate of melting does depend on the differential temperature. Obviously, if it's very hot, it's gonna melt real quick. But the, it's going to melt no matter what, only provided the temperature is above zero. And it's going to freeze if it's less than zero Celsius. So if average temperature is less than zero, water will freeze even if the temperature is increasing real fast. From minus 100 C to 50, minus 50 C, it's still going to freeze. If average temperature of the surroundings is greater than zero C, ice will melt even if the temperature is dropping. So I'm, I, I hope you generally understand what I'm trying to say. In other words, ice melts because its surroundings are too warm, not because they are warming. This is the basic idea of the derivative in calculus that Newton told us in the Principia in 1687. Media doesn't understand calculus. Science eight. Earth's atmospheric temperature is not measurable. 
Well, oh, that's a provocative statement. How do, you, how do you prove that? Temperature is a point property of the energy content of vibrating and radiating molecules. Physics has no rigorous definition or method to average temperatures of bulk matter that account for changes or the dissimilar. They account for changes in temperature or state or composition or pressure or heat capacity or velocity or reactions. Air, temperature and pressure and composition change with altitude, latitude, clouds, time of day, season, weather fronts and deforestations. So you can have thermometers, a thousand of them all around the earth and obviously you can add up those th temperatures and divide by a thousand and say, oh, that's the average. But you see, if, if all thousand of those thermometers are in Key West, Florida, then you're not getting a very representative measure. And we don't know how to, to do that properly. Wien's law gives an average surface temperature from radiation emitted by black bodies like stars, but it does not apply to bodies dominated by non-uniform variable reflection like Earth. Science 9. UN IPCC climate models incorrectly assume Earth's radiation to space decreases as its temperature increases. The Stefan Boltzmann law states all bodies radiate proportional to temperature to the fourth. In July 2009, Professor Richard Linson, an MIT meteorologist, a, a very knowledgeable man, he verified Earth obeys this law. Control engineers know that all matter reaches an equilibrium temperature due to this change mitigating effect. Otherwise, Earth would have exploded or frozen long ago. So UN climate models that are empirical are hence wrong. Science 10. Uh, there was a proposal called the Waxman-Markey Bill in the House of Representatives uh, called a CO2 cap and trade bill. And it would require the United States of America to reduce its CO2 production by 83% from 2010 to 2050. Using the discredited empirical UN IPC models, they predicted in the law, proposed law, the bill, that this would reduce CO2 in the world by 20 parts per million and the temperature by 0.05 C after 40 years. Uh, physics predicts the temperature change would be vanishingly small, approaching zero. Science 11. Sea level is changing slowly and naturally in direct proportion to land ice changes, but not floating sea ice, guys, gentlemen. Archimedes proved his buoyancy law about 250 BC. The majority of northern hemisphere glaciers have been receding since the ice age ended 18,000 years ago. They did not really accelerate in a measurable way since 1900. All anthropogenic global warming scares like hurricanes, droughts, and dying polar bears have been competently debunked, in my opinion. Science 12. Arctic ice shrinks annually when Earth is too warm, but Siberian and Canadian snowfall tends to increase once a little bit on the warm side, increasing the northern hemisphere solar reflectivity, causing Earth to cool and ice to grow again. So it's a compensating, mitigating factor that leads to stability of a dynamic system. A plausible mechanism for these regular 40,000 year ice age cycles has been related to the shallowness of the Barents Sea south of Spitsbergen, where the Gulf Stream can break through into the Arctic Ocean periodically. It's a kind of a switch deal. Data indicate another regular ice age began around 2000, not long ago, and CO2 is not involved. Now I'm going to switch to a little engineering for you. Earth's temperature system cannot be adequately modeled for control. Modeling and control of multivariable, nonlinear dynamic systems like fluid cat crackers and refineries, crude oil distillation, coking, hydrocracking, gasoline blending, has been commercialized since the 1980 and deployed throughout the hydrocarbon processing and chemical industries ever since. Control systems engineering has been implemented for mechanical and electrical systems like aircraft and spacecraft since uh, as early as 1960, at least 19, 1980. Earth's temperature system cannot be adequately measured and controlled, I said. I'm going to make you aware now that there are mathematical criteria devised by mathematicians and systems engineers back in the 1960s that give us criteria as to whether or not a system that we're thinking about controlling whether it's measurable or whether it's observable or whether it's controllable, whether those criteria are satisfied or not. The reason we did that, of course, is that we wouldn't want to 
generate a lot of embarrassment by going off and trying to do something that's impossible if we can figure it out at the beginning. Mankind has no decision process for properly setting the global temperature set point or CO2 targets for that matter. In fact, I declare that most of us don't really have a good policy for setting our own home thermostats either. <laughs> but my wife and I figured it out. She gets to do it and I'd say, yes, dear. The rigorous procedure for optimizing risky trade-offs for the hydrocarbon processing industry control system set points, like thermostats, was published in a magazine in December 1996, and I'm the guy that did it. So just as a little information, I see every decision make that we approach is related to a trade-off, a value trade-off, profit, if you will. And it's shaped like a hill or a tent, and over here, not such a good idea, bad deal. Over here, also not so good. Coldilocks was right, not too hot, not too cold, just right. And uh, most of the decisions we make relate to finding that optimum best position. And when there's a risk involved, there's a distribution, and my technology, my engineering, um, uh, will optimize risky trade-offs. And, and that's central for the business of in, in, in uh, oil refining. We want to maximize our yields and product quality, and we want to maximize our safety performance simultaneously. You can't do that unless you know how to optimize a risky trade-off. And what I'm telling you is the central decision process for operating the whole hydrocarbon processing industry. And in fact, it's the process that folks that are now driving from Albuquerque to Santa Fe the sciences don't go over 70, but everybody's got a speed controller on there. And some folks, they're really in a hurry. They're running late. Got to get there. They got lots of money. What's one ticket? What the heck? They're going by 74. But if it's really raining out there and it's ice and snow and you're poor and you had two tickets and this one, you're going to lose your license and you might get thrown in jail and you don't have a fuzz buster, and you've never been there before, and there's car cops all over the place. You back the darn thing down. You're going to go about 60 or so, huh? What are you doing? You're optimizing a risky trade-off whether you like it or not. And that trade-off exists whether you know it or not. So if you think that you've got a you humanity, you've got a prayer once you get your thermostat built of figuring out how in the world you're going to set the temperature of the earth, <laughs> you're never going to get there, not in ever. Here's an engineering comment. Nuclear power is not useful simply because it produces no CO2, but because it could be profitable, in my opinion. Engineers at DuPont, Westinghouse, and General Electric have commercialized recovery of uranium, spent uranium from safe bridger reactor fuel with manageable recycle waste since around 1960. It costs money, but um, it can be done. And if it's profitable and safe, why not? I'll point out there's a little town not far from here, actually. It's called Delta, Colorado. It's on the western slope south of Grand Junction. It holds commercially recoverable uranium-238 ores, equivalent to 1,000 times the energy content of all the fossil fuels in the Earth. Ex uh, and it's got a lot of thorium in it, too. Exporting enriched reactor-grade U-235 fuel by the United States would have preserved oil and dedicated it to transportation fuels and petrochemicals rather than just burning it to make electricity. It could have reversed the U.S. trade deficits 20, 30 years ago, accelerated peaceful, inexpensive nuclear power generation worldwide. Might have even had some political implications for all I know. The energy from, this is a note, energy from one kilogram of U-235, uh, I figure equals about the same as three million kilograms of coal. Uh, the basic engineering principle here is to Use feedstocks to, to make things fin that are financially attractive to mankind, your fellow man, and, and focus and be specific. And um, that's what engineers try to do all day long. Moving on to the world of what I call ethics, engineers do have a code of ethics, just like physicians do. 
and lawyers do. You get an attaboy for that snicker over there. <laughs> Gradual warming of the earth is good, could be good. I'll tell you why it might be good. Earth's flora, fauna, and mankind have flourished since earth warmed again around 18,000 years ago. That's when the last ice age ended. Humans have been walking around this earth around five million years. And I understand that the ice age cycle is on the order of 50,000 years per cycle, maybe 100, but bear with me. If it's 50,000 years, we get about 10 or 15 warm and 45 to 50 to maybe even 90,000 years of ice, which could be as much as a mile deep on top of Chicago. Well, 50,000 years divided by 5 million, we've been through 100 of them already. I met a lady, her name was Lucy, and she walked around here 3 million years ago, and I met her personally in the Houston Museum of Natural Science two years ago. Oh, by the way, New Yorkers retired of Florida. Canadians like to go to Phoenix. Chicagoans go to Hawaii, and Germans retire in Provence. Ethics 18. Taxing energy production is a bad idea. Energy management is basic. By the way, we don't create it. You see, I use the word management. We manage it. It's basic to human prosperity and well-being. Profitable conversion of heat to work since 1780 has created great comfort and wealth and happiness for all who know how to do it. That Waxman-Markey house bill will never work. Ethically, ethics, India, China, Africa, and Russia will continue to produce CO2 from burning their own coal, oil, and gas to their credit, and their people will prosper because of it. Ethics 20, Al Gore at Oxford on July 8, 2009, created a, he created a video that I have. He promoted the notion, we've got to have more research, and his proposal was to violate the second law of thermal. He condemned power plants and what vehicle combustion, the auto cycle, it wastes 70% of the fuel energy in, inside there. Isn't that a crime against humanity? Not realizing that in 1824, Sadi Carnot proved, he's an engineer by the way, the maximum theoretical frictionless reversible energy is WO over QI, and it's 1 minus T2 over T1, where QI is the total heat into the system and WO is the network out that, that we, we really need because it really makes life nice, nicer. T1 is the temperature of the heat source, like the flame or steam, and T2 is the temperature of the surroundings, the air, cooling water, the environment. Can't do much about that. Great engineers have labeled to approach maximum economic efficiency ever since. So we have great enterprises at BMW and General Motors and Toyota and and um, uh, Mercedes-Benz, and he comes along, and he wants to go to Oxford University, condemns all that and says, it's garbage and we got to do research. Ethics 21, corrupting science is bad. Al Gore promotes spending by governments around the globe to finance his multi-billion dollar venture capital fund, which is called KPCB, got a nice website, they own 16 green tech firms, some of which have already gone under, and some are Google. Providing government grants for fraudulent science research, promoting caps on CO2 production is a conflict of interest. And I'll let you worry about, think, see if you can agree with that all by yourself. I personally found flawed science in some peer-reviewed papers in science and the proceedings of the Royal Society and published my findings in a letter to a magazine back in 2009. And by the way, that one in the Royal Society, this guy is, oh, I think he was an astrophysicist, but his job was to claim that the variations in solar intensity um, don't correlate with versions, variations in the temperature of the Earth, and it's all due to CO2. And I found some flaws in that. Shame on the Royal Society. Ethics, oh, this is ethics now. <laughs> and I'm not even a scientist. Ethics 22. On April 2009, the United States EPA issued instructions for comments on, quote, proposed endangerment and cause or contribute findings for greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. 
And they did that as mandated as they were preparing to declare CO2 a pollutant. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that under the law that was passed by Congress, that law authorized uh, EPA to declare CO2 a pollutant with a proviso, provided it's scientifically based and sound. Got to be right. Then authorize them to do any fraud. But they claim under current law and court president, I'm authorized to do so, and within six months they did. So, conclusions. Knowledgeable environmental engineers like me do support reforestation and efforts to curtail, curtail anthropogenic pollutants like CO2, uh, SO2, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, there's several of them, benzene, um, CFCs, particulates, and surface ozone. Just as an aside there, Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 led to the creation in the United States of, we call them boutique gasolines. It's under reformulated gasolines. So the government mandates that a refiner make his ref refinery were in Texas or Louisiana. If he's going to sell that gasoline in, in St. Louis, it's got to meet the standards for St. Louis or Chicago or Los Angeles. And that this made blending of gasoline a lot more complicated than just octane and vapor pressure. And I was involved with very sophisticated multivariable computer controls of gasoline blending, particularly in California refineries. And I'm kind of proud to say that we, we did a lot to, not me, I mean, I, I was involved with really doing engineering to clean up the atmosphere of the Los Angeles Basin. Now, these, uh, we environmental engineers oppose depriving Earth's flora of their green plant food, choking and starving them for personal gain. In fact, I like harmless CO2. I exhale some at its concentration of about 40,000 parts per million by volume out of my mouth every four seconds. And each of you have just been doing the same thing. Thank you very much. CO2 and O2 are the basic molecules of the life cycle between Earth's flora and its fauna. The miracle of life, photosynthesis reaction, should not be tampered with lightly. Starving and choking plants of their food supply would be a monumental crime against humanity, all fauna and flora and the environment and Mother Earth itself. Since there are no graduate or licensed chemical process control engineers in the entire UN IPCC or the United States Congress or the Cabinet or the Supreme Court, these incompetent groups continue to waste time and money since 1997 attempting the impossible, designing Earth's thermostat using anthropogenic CO2. No one has controlled the climate of an entire planet. Climate experts like MIT professor Richard Linson, Princeton physicist and former Department of Energy Research Director Professor William Happer, University of Virginia atmospheric physicist Fred Singer, and there's a website, climatedepot.com. I think they're reliable sources for you. I forecast this paper will remain valid beyond the year 3000 AD. And if engineers consider this report good news, that's okay. And I welcome any proof of errors, and I apologize if I have offended anyone. Here's a quote. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. Uh, Albert told us that. And in every enterprise, consider the outcome. I got that on a Chinese fortune cookie a couple, a year ago. Those are my conclusions, but I'm going to leave you with what I call a parting shot. This is my gift to this conference. T is unmeasurable. I'm going to do this in about three or four slides, so bear with me and I'll be done. Satellite spectrometers measure Earth's average radiating intensity, day and night, pole to pole, summer and winter. They have to average all that. And it comes out to be about I, that's intensity of radiation, about 239 watts per square meter of the surface of the Earth. No controversy on that, I guess. I, maybe it's not right, but I'll accept it for now. I, the intensity of radiating globe, varies with the solar input, and it varies with flora photosynthesis rate. The latter increases with solar intensity coming down and atmospheric temperature and concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And I have the rate of, rate of reaction of that. It was developed in 1924. And it shows that photosynthesis reduces temperature and it eats up CO2. 
And that's a cooling effect and a stabilizing effect. There's no tipping points in hockey, hockey sticks that I can find. And this is neglected in the, the greenhouse gas theory. It's all radiation, nothing. So I'm, that's the point of this. Now, the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law gives the temperature of any radiating body with uh, a certain emissivity. E, it's got to be less than one in real life. And there's the little form the fort right back there. You can go and look, look at Wiki. You should know this law. If you, I've rearranged it and solved for K is temperature. And it's equal to 100 times I, the intensity of radiation, which is in the units of watts per square meter surface of the Earth. And 5.67 is Boltzmann's universal constant. And in this version, that's raised to the 0 0.25 power. OK, look at that equation. Look at that equation. Earth's global emissivity is difficult to measure or determine. But the standard global climate model in Wikipedia says it's about 0.612. And I'll, I'll tell you that that number will increase with the content of in, increasing content of radiating gases in the atmosphere like H2O and CO2. Why is that? Because uh, oxygen itself is not really a radiating gas. So when we convert oxygen to CO2 molecules, which is a radiating gas, the atmosphere will radiate a little more. And although CO2's uh, emissivity is pretty low, it's about 0.1, or it's as complicated as Robitaille told us, it really drops with temperature. And so it is complicated. But nevertheless, um, if you take, if you displace zero with a 0.1 radiating gas in the atmosphere, the emissivity of the Earth will go up. Since E is in the denominator of that real complicated equation I just gave you, if E increases, K decreases. Hmm. Doubling CO2 from 400 parts per million to 800 parts per million uh, would increase the emissivity of the Earth by about 0.001. And I'm vague on that. Don't crucify me if that's a little bit off, but I think I'm close. In which case, emissivity would go up to 0.613. Okay, so the temperature at 239 and 0.612 comes out 288 Kelvin, 14.93 Celsius. That's a generally accepted value. That's cool. I mean, that's correct. I mean, that's okay with me. Now, T1 is what it would be if the emissivity went up due to CO2 by the 0.613. And the answer is the temperature drops to 287. 0.96, it drops down to 14.81 Celsius. So the difference between those two is the change, and the answer is minus 0.1156C. That looks like cooling. And I will comment that dropping the intensity itself would drop T1 even more, a little more cooling. But that's too complicated for me. I will tell you that the UNIPC has been saying for 15 years that the doubling of the CO2 would cause a change in the temperature of the Earth of at least 1.5 C plus to as much as 4.5 C. And I'm troubled with that. I use the word wrong, but I don't want to be controversial. Parting shot four. Greenhouse gas theory is shot down. There you have it all in five sentences. So what's all the fuss about? When I was in kindergarten, Henry Penny and Chicken Little went around saying, the sky's falling, the sky's falling. But they didn't like it to say how fast or when. And uh, there's no astrophysics here. This is just chemical engineering. This is important. Um, first, I've got to preface this comment by telling you that the, the greenhouse gas theory's claim is that it, it's Greenhouse gases cause 33 Celsius heating of the Earth, of the atmosphere. That goes back to 1981, James Hansen, NASA. He assumed Earth was a black body radiating with E equals 1.0, and he deduced Earth's radiating temperature to be temperature of a black body equal to, see the 1.0 in there, and his answer came out 254K, which is minus 18.3 C. Since it's measured to be about plus 15 C, he declared 
It's called a declaration. He defined and created a thing called the greenhouse gas effect. And that for the Earth is 288 minus 254 equals 33 degrees C. Everybody was horrified. Hansen got famous, Al Gore got rich, and the rest is history. Thank you for your attention.